So tonight I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a virtual talk that I created this past summer, partly to help public libraries re-engage with patrons now at a time when many were closed, uh, just barely reopening and looking for new programming to help re-engage and reconnect with patrons. And this talk is a whirlwind tour around New England. Uh, not a lot of uh, traditional uh, tourist spots because that's not my thing. If you know my uh, my main streets and back roads stories around New England for Chronicle, uh, I'm I'm all about finding things that are off the beaten path, quirky, different. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of that, a lot of that tonight. So let's jump in. Let's jump in. So you know, I always say when, when I ask people to describe New England, I say you know think of it as like you know when you think of like an iconic landmark restaurant that's built up a reputation for certain dishes, right? So certain signature dishes. I always say, like, geographically, what would you say New England's signatures are, right? So obviously the ocean. You would say the ocean. There's Portland Headlight, right? You would say mountains. New England, one of only two regions of the country where you have genuine mountains. That's, that's above 2,500 feet meeting an ocean. The only other place in the country is Northern California into the Pacific Northwest Coast. So we're only one of two regions, obviously, history, huge part of New England's signature. Why not? It's the oldest white settlement, European settled part of the country, right? So why wouldn't history be a huge part of that? Um, and like, you know, using the restaurant metaphor, I would say, you know, great dishes, great places have like great sides, right? Great side dishes. So I would say, what, what, what are New England's great sides, right? And I would say politics, right? sports and actual food in this case we're talking about seafood which a lot of people come to new england just just for that now extra points to if you know that that natty gentleman in the fedora there in the black and white photograph is none other than boston's famous rogue mayor james michael curley uh number six in the celtics uniform in the middle of course is legendary hall of fame center bill russell and that's a lobster uh, so diners if you back to that, you know, if you've watched my, my stories, travel stories around New England, you, you know that invariably I end up visiting a diner. Sometimes they're old friends, diners that I know and, and love. And sometimes the better ones, even when, I'm, when I'm, I'm getting to be introduced to a brand new diner that I haven't visited before. So diners are born in New England, right? So we are going to, at the end, I got a little bonus, bo quick little lightning tour, bonus trip right when we're done. And I'm going to share with you my favorite diners from the states that we're going to visit. So with that, here's, here's our heading. So you have a sense of, you know, I always like to, if you're taking a trip, right, I want to know. I want to know wh where, where we're going. I, I, in fact, I drive my wife crazy because I still love unfolding a regular old print hard copy map. Yes, I use GPS, but I like to know where I am in relation to other places, which you don't get from GPS. Maybe some of you feel the same way. So here's a good old map type image. Um, this is, this is, this is going to be a direction. We're gonna, Boston's going to be our, our, our center. It's going to be our starting point and our end point. And we're going to go north out of Boston to the North Shore. And then we're going to go further north, down east, as it were, to Maine. Then we're going to go west into the mountains of New Hampshire and further west into the Green Mountains of Vermont. Then we're gonna dive back south and we're gonna re-enter Massachusetts through the Berkshires and a little surprise there right at the end. So, all set, everybody comfortable? Got a comfortable chair, drink, snack, whatever you need, and we're off. All right, so I said first we're gonna stop on the North Shore. So the North Shore is a region of New England, Massachusetts that I know well, uh, mostly because I grew up there. Or I should say, I mean, Winthrop is considered the North Shore in the same way that Quincy is considered the South Shore, which is to say really just the gateway to the North Shore, just like Quincy is kind of the gateway to the South Shore, right? Um, 1630, uh, it, uh, it, it was settled 10 years after, uh, at the same time as Boston, uh, 10 years after the, the Pilgrims had landed in Plymouth. Um, when I grew up in Winthrop, my dominant memory, my overriding attachment with Winthrop is airplanes. Because <laughs> Winthrop, uh, or as I like to refer to it, the charming little seaside town at the end of runway 27L, uh, is just that. It is right next to Logan Airport. 
uh, I mean, like within a thousand yards of a runway at Logan Airport. I have a couple of, a few arrows there. One is pointing to Winter Highlands, uh, where I grew up. And uh, I think that might be close to where my house was. And uh, another arrow pointing at a plane, appropriately enough, because they land every 18 to 21 seconds uh, right over Winthrop. And uh, the field in Point Shirley in Winthrop, uh, where I played Little League Baseball, um, which is exactly uh, 2,700 yards from the end of runway 27L. So I used to think I could actually see people waving in, in, in the windows of a plane when it was landing. At that point, they were only about 550 feet. By the time they land, you know, get over that field, they're probably less than 300 feet. Um, but uh, I probably was imagining that. I probably was imagining that. Needless to say, you could never sight a major metropolitan airport uh, so close to a, a congested, densely populated urban environment today. But that was 1920s, and uh, when Logan was built, and they were uh, propeller mail planes, and nobody was foreseeing jumbo jets. With that, we'll continue on up to the, the real North Shore. Um, you know, Cape Ann is one of my favorite places in New England, certainly one of my favorite places in Massachusetts. And, you know, I'm fond of reminding people that the state has two, count them, two capes, right? Only one of them is the one that simply carries with it an assumption that you're talking about Cape Cod, right? If you say on Friday, hey, I'm going to the Cape for the weekend, nobody says, which one, right? It's, an, it's assumed you're going to Cape Cod. But there are two legitimate Capes in Massachusetts. And Cape Ann is the, is the lesser well-known one. It's not as famous. It's older. It, European settlement there with permanent fishing village in the 16th century. So a full century before, before, the, before Plymouth um, in, in Gloucester. But um, the funny thing about Cape Ann is that it was an island until the 1950s. Only in the 1950s did the, did the Abram P. and Andrew Bridge connect Cape Ann with Route 128, and then it was no longer an island. Um, Gloucester is the only city uh, on, on Cape Ann, some wonderful towns, Lanesville, Rockport, but Gloucester's the only legitimate city, America's most storied seaport. I love to point out that this photograph is of one, one of my wonderful longtime friends, Mark Canigas. Mark Canigas is a wonderful landscape photographer, had a gallery on Bearskin Neck in Rockport for many, many years. Uh, still a wonderful landscape photographer. Took this picture of, of Gloucester Harbor, took this picture of uh, his hometown, Rockport. You know, of course, that is motif number one. Uh, very famous. Um, in fact, uh, it is on the cover of my first book. I had nothing to do with that, wouldn't have been my choice, but apparently that's what publishers think about when they think about New England. So they, uh, they picked up motif number one. Funny story, um, if you look behind that red building of motif number one, you will see, if you look carefully, you will see a white building behind it. Looks like very much the same type of building, but it's white. So about... 10 years ago or so, 10, 12 years ago, my friend Mark Canigas, the photographer, introduced me to a friend of his, Gussie Contrino. Gussie's a wonderful, longtime colorful figure in Rockport, lobsterman, uh, lobsters off of Rockport. And uh, we were standing in Rockport Harbor one day, and I said to Gussie, I said, Gussie, what is that white building that's just behind motif number one? And without missing a beat, Gussie said, motif number two. <laughs> Ask a stupid question right? Um, Halibut Point, which is just past Rockport, uh, one of my favorite places on Cape Ann. It is one of two places on the United States, the other being um, in Maine, that catch the very first rays of rising sun, rising light um, on the continental U.S. Halibut Point. What I love about Halibut Point is that it is right next door to the lobster pool on Cape Ann, and it is one of my favorite places. I've been taking my kids there from the time they, they, they couldn't even walk. Um, beautiful place to catch the sunset. The reason I, I wanted to mention it is that the lobster pool, obviously famous for lobster, but that's not what Cape Ann is famous for. Cape Ann is famous for clams, not lobster. Um, and one particular kind of clam, fried clams. Why? Well, Cape Ann is said to be the birthplace of the fried clam. You probably have heard, You many of you I'm sure have been 
to Woodman's in uh, Essex on Cape Ann. And the story goes like this. The story goes that, that just over 100 years ago, July 1916, uh, Chubby Woodman and his wife, Bessie, had a little store in Essex on the same site as Woodman's today. And uh, they sold uh, shellfish. They also had a fryer. And uh, Bessie would chop up thinly sliced potatoes, so their version of like a potato chip. Uh, and they would, uh, they would sell these. They would sell these. So you get a carton of those with your, with your clams. And um, the story goes that one hot summer day in 1916, a fisherman friend of theirs came into the store, and he's watching Chubby chuck clams, and he said, hey, Chubb, what do you suppose would happen if you threw one of those clams in the fryer? How do you think that would be? And Chubby, ever an adventurous sort, I guess, said, I don't know, let's find out. He tossed the clam in, and it came out, and it was inedible. It was like rubber, right? Bessie, his wife, thus proving forevermore the truth of the maxim that behind every successful man is an even smarter woman, took a shuck clam, dredged it through the dough, the flour batter that she was using for the potatoes, Dropped that in the fryer later, took that out. The rest is history. Guys thought it was delicious. The fried clam was born. Today, Route 133, which is the main route off of Cape Ann and out to the rest of the state, uh, Route 133 up there, is called Clam Highway because of the prevalence of the number of clam places that you'll find all along uh, Route 133. There are basically three, I would say, sort of landmark fried clam places today. Obviously, one of the Woodman's. But the other is Farnham's, which is just literally a stone's throw in Essex, just down the same street as Woodman's. And I would say the other would be over in Ipswich, the Clam Box. Um, and the funny thing is people have often referred to these three iconic places as sort of vying against each other in a kind of clam war over the decades. Nothing could be further from the truth. I've talked to the owners of all three places and they say, get out. They say, we're all old friends. On a hot summer night, if things are busy, we run out of, one of us runs out of clams, we'll send a runner over to Farnham's or whoever. We'll send a runner over to get a bushel, get a, you know, a couple of gallons of clams. It's no big deal. We're all good friends. So I guess the clam wars, it makes for fun, fun buzz, but it's not actually the truth. So we're out of Massachusetts. We're heading north and we're heading east at the same time. So as New Englanders, you probably know, and it doesn't make sense to anybody else, anywhere else in the country, right? But if you're heading north to Maine, so you're going up to Maine, right? We call that going down east. I don't know how that, that's a good one to find out, but it makes no sense, but there it is. And we're heading into Maine, where the mountains truly do meet the sea. I'm gonna share with you my two favorite factoids about Maine, okay? Now, one of them is evident from this map right here. Um, Maine is the only state in the, in the country that borders only one other state, New Hampshire. Now, I think if Maine had its way, it wouldn't border any other state at all, but that would make Maine Hawaii, so that wouldn't really work. The other factoid is also visible in a way, but it's much less evident. So think about the ragged and rocky coast of Maine, right? It threads its way in and out, all through those little tiny nooks and crannies and hamlets and villages and harbor towns and cities, all those little finger peninsulas sticking out into the Gulf of Maine, all those little harbor islands. You know, if you go just halfway, if you started on, on you know, Kittery and you're winding your way on one at 1A, and you're winding your way along the coastal route just to get to Machias or Eastport, right? The elbow there in the Gulf of Maine, that can take you eight or nine hours. If you're, you know, you, you go in a leisurely way, it's going to take you six and a half minimum, closer to seven. If you flew from across the Gulf of Maine, say from Logan to Machias, it's still going to take you 35, 40 minutes, 400, 450 miles or so. Do you know, if you could straighten out the coast of Maine, like a, like a balled up piece of twine, right? Just bing, 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 bing. If you could straighten it out into a straight line, you know what you'd get? 3,000 miles. In other words, the distance from Boston to San Francisco. My favorite main factoid. Now you can tell people tomorrow and you'll, very, you'll really impress people. 
So one of my favorite places in Maine, which I want to share. Um, anybody know where this is? Now, if you think the lighthouse looks familiar, there's a good reason for that, because that lighthouse was replicated in many, many different places. It, 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 became a, it was a very economical design. So it was used for many, many lighthouses throughout the 19th century. Um, it looks like the Nubble, right? It looks like the Nobska in Falmouth on the Cape. Um, it looks like a shortened version of Boston Light. How about now, if I tell you that we're on Muskongas Bay? So probably a lot of you are like, where the hell's Muskongas Bay? Right, so not very well known, not very well known, but we are at in Pemaquid Point. Pemaquid sits at the end of one of those narrow finger peninsulas sticking out into the coast of Maine, about halfway up mid-coast, mid-coast Maine. So if you were driving up, you'd pass Portland, you would get to say uh, Topsom, Brunswick, and then you would bang a right, you'd go south for about 21 miles, you would reach the little town of Bristol, Maine, and this is what you'd see at the end of the road, right there. That's what you'd be looking out at, the ocean is behind that. And that's what's always drawn me to Pemaquid is what's behind the lighthouse. Because behind the lighthouse, there's about five and a half, six acres of these, this field of these long striated rocks. And it's fascinating. I've been there all four seasons of the year, whether it's sunrise, sunset, a dark, stormy day, sunny day. It just is just this, this amazing place, Pemaquid, one of my... I think of it when I think of the ragged and rocky coast of Maine. It's like that's the image that always comes to mind for me. So as long as we're in the Brunswick, Maine area, I'm going to share with you uh, a little quest of mine. So for about 20 years in my reporting all around New England, um, I had kind of a quest going on. Um, I love clam chowder. I'm sure some of you love clam chowder too. So I had kind of a quest going on, which was to find the best clam chowder in New England. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure I minded, you know, that the, that the quest was kind of open-ended because that just meant I had to keep trying clam chowder everywhere I went. And then lo and behold, about seven years ago, the quest ended. I found the best clam chowder I've ever tasted in my life, and it was in Brunswick, Maine. Um, and most unlikely place, little place called Buttermilk Cove, but more unlikely, Grinnett Trading Company, which doesn't sound like a seafood place. And even more unlikely, it was a former little two-car car repair garage. And Julie and Brian Soper, the owners, uh, they opened it up about 10 years ago. Uh, both were commercial fishermen. Julie was a ground fisherman. She decided she loved to cook. She decided she wanted to get in off the water. Who could blame her? and uh, open up her own place. Brian still is a commercial scalper today. He brings his scallops in fresh whenever he has them. Um, I have seen him walk in about 11.30, 11.45 in the morning, just as Julie's opening up for lunch. And he'll come in with a uh, bushel of scallops. And I'll tell you what, if you order scallops for lunch that day, you may have no idea that Brian had just brought them in, but you would be eating scallops that might have been sitting on the ocean floor less than an hour earlier. That's fresh, but I digress. This is about clams, not scallops. So I went in first about seven years ago, and I ordered the clam chowder, of course, because I had to sample it, and you know, a sandwich, maybe a clam roll or something like that. Um, and Julie brought out a bowl of clam chowder, and um, that was it. That was it. I'm not going to describe it as a religious experience, uh, but might have been close. Um, I, I got to tell you, I um, <laughs> my longtime photographer Carl Vieira um, has said to me many times over the years. He said, "Your face when you tasted that clam chowder." Um, so I skipped the sandwich. I ordered a second bowl of clam chowder. The last time I was in there about five years ago, Julie. Uh, as I left, she uh, she brought me a quart of the clam chowder. Incredible. So now you know where to go for the best clam chowder in New England. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So we're done with Maine. We're heading west into the mountains. Now, if you go through the western mountains of Maine and you hit the border with New Hampshire, you are now in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. 
and uh, the highest mountain that you will encounter in New Hampshire or anywhere east of the Mississippi River for that matter is Mount Washington, just under 6,300 feet. Um, just an incredibly legendary mountain, some of the worst weather in the world. World famous because the highest wind ever recorded uh, was recorded on Mount Washington. So all kinds of legends and stories associated with it. Maybe, I think for a lot of people in New England, they know Mount Washington because they have driven up the famous auto road. Maybe some of you have too, right? Uh, which was built, believe it or not, before the Civil War. Uh, and my favorite story about the auto road involves my longtime photographer for Chronicle, Carl Vieira. So Carl and I, we were, we were shooting up there about, I don't know, maybe 10, 11 years ago. And um, we, were, we were down at the base of Pinkham Notch, at the base of Mount Washington, and it was incredibly clear, like unusually clear. And I said, geez, we should, we should just jump in the car and go up the auto road and get some pictures from the summit because you just don't usually get that. Um, and there's no telling once you start up that it won't cloud up at the summit anyway, but it didn't. Uh, but getting up there was a story. So we started heading up the auto road. Now, all I can tell you is we got to the summit and there you see Carl, my longtime photographer, one of my wonderful friends in life. Uh, uh, now there we are at the summit and yeah, he's smiling there, but he wasn't smiling about 30 minutes earlier. So we started driving up the auto road, right? And we're up about the 2000 foot mark. So we've been driving about 30 minutes. And I can tell that Carl is not doing well. I don't know what's going on, but he's like not himself. He's like getting all fidgety. And I said, what is going on? And he said, I have to, uh, I have to confess something. Uh, he said, I have a phobia that you don't know about. And it's kicking in. And I was like, oh, my God, what? And he said, and mind you, we had been, we've been everywhere. We've been in little planes, big planes, helicopters, gliders, on the water, under the water, you name it. So I'm like, what? What is it? <clears throat> what it was, he has a phobia about being on a high, like, mountain road with a steep drop off where there's no guardrail. Apparently, we had never done that before. And um, he could not keep driving. We had to pull over. Uh, there's no shoulder, obviously. So we had to stop and actually stop a few cars. And we had to switch places. And Carl had to continue with that red jacket he's wearing right there over his head so he couldn't see anything. Um, yeah, so he, Carl knows that I, I, I love to talk about this story. He just doesn't know how often I do. Uh, to how many people. <laughs> so another famous mountain in New Hampshire, uh, and also one of my fav favorite places in New Hampshire, you're looking at a lake called Profile Lake. How did it get the name Profile Lake? Because it reflected the profile of the most famous landmark in New Hampshire history. And you know I'm talking about the Great Stone Face, which presided for eons over Franconia Notch, the old man. You know, the old man of the mountain is absolutely synonymous with New Hampshire, even now that it's gone. Uh, some of the earliest photographs ever taken in New Hampshire, daguerreotypes, were of the great stone face. Postcards you see there, historic postcards. The old man of the mountain is still, the image is still on the state of New Hampshire's license plate. Um, and I, I think that many of you probably share my experience as a kid, I'll never forget, right? You remember that experience as a kid the first time your parents perhaps pointed out to you the old stone face, the, the great stone face. You're driving up 93, probably northbound because that's where you got the best shot at it. And you'd be driving up and you, you, your parents would be describing that you're going to see, you're going to be looking up and you're going to see this, this, this old man made out of stone, the stone face. They're like, what? And you know, but you had to look just at the right moment and you had to look quick and then it was going to be gone. Right. And you'd be driving where, where, and then they'd be like, now, look now. Right. And you'd look up and there it was, there it was, there was the old stone face. What we didn't see when we were growing up, I didn't really know about, you know, until years later doing stories up there. What we didn't see was all the steps that had been taken for a hundred years to preserve the old man. 
because people knew. We didn't know. I didn't know, right? But people who knew, knew. Geologists knew that the Great Stone Face, the pro, that rock face was going to come down. By the way, it wasn't one rock face. The, the, the Great Stone Face was made up of seven separate stone outcroppings that together, viewed at just the right moment, created that profile like a Rubik's cube coming together. And experts knew that that was going to come down someday. I mean, the irony was that what we were looking up at and what looked like a stone face was itself the result of other, other stone outcroppings that had fallen over the years to eventually, you know, have, have created by accident, you know, what looked like a profile. But everybody knew, they all knew that that profile was going to come down someday. And people had taken heroic measures over a century. There, there were giant turnbuckles up there, huge cables that you can see that were all meant to shore up the old man. And it did. It did for a long time. But it was always going to come down. And in early May 2003, it did. Uh, it was kind of like a perfect storm. The early spring that year in New Hampshire had been unusually warm. A warm front had come through. And for four or five days, almost a week, temperatures have been all flirting with 70 degrees, some torrential rain. And then a cold front came through. The temperature dropped almost 50 degrees, dropped well below freezing in 24 hours. And uh, you know what happens with water when it freezes? It forms ice, ice expands. And sometime about one o'clock in the morning, it's thought the great stone face came down and it was gone. Um, you know, so many people were upset. I remember talking to one of my, one of my favorite New Englanders, the wonderful late Dick Hamilton, who I always joked to him was the other old man of the mountain. Dick was, um, head of, uh, tourism in the, in the White Mountains. And, uh, he lived, uh, just north of the Notch in Littleton. He worked just south of the Notch in Woodstock, drove home through the Notch every night and told me once, I know who my real boss is, he said. Every night I drive through the notch, I look up there at the old man and I say, good night, boss. And Dick was put in charge by then governor of New Hampshire uh, to heading up a committee to look at how best to memorialize the old man of the mountain. And uh, they got a lot of proposals, some of them good, some of them crazy, like creating a replica of the old man out of concrete. I'm so glad that didn't happen. But um, Dick was put in charge and Dick selected with his commission, I think one of the best means of memorializing the old man that ever possibly could have been conceived. Ron Magers is a toy designer, lives in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And Ron came up with something he called the profiler. And the profiler, as you can see, they look like they're in place now. And they look like nothing so much as, as seven uh, inverted hockey sticks. But what's ingenious about Ron, what Ron did is that looking up at these profiles don't just allow you to see how the old man looked. It also recreates the experience that you had in seeing him. Because as we were talking about a moment ago, seeing the old man involved, putting yourself in just the right position, right? So look at a, if you can see, um, the end of those upturned hockey sticks, the profile, they have the, in miniature, the seven small separate stone outcroppings. I actually have a miniature of one right here. I never know for sure if this will work, but I'll tell you what, as I hold this up to my camera here, you can see, you can see, right? You can see the seven tiny, though that's what made up the old man. If I turn this, I don't know if you'll see, there you go, uh, kind of, right? You can kind of see how the, that's how it works right? That's how it works. You get yourself in front of one of those and you look up there at just the right position and it's like he's there again. Ingenious, ingenious way of memorializing the old man. So before we leave New Hampshire, I'm going to share with you two of my favorite people in New Hampshire, uh, other than the wonderful late Dick Hamilton. So maybe some of you have also traveled an antique highway, 21 miles between Dover, Durham, right? UNH that, and then it winds its way, Route 4, winds its way kind of northwest uh, to uh, Epsom, the traffic circle, and uh, uh, Shychester, and um, Antique Alley, Antique Alley. One of my favorite places 
uh, an antique alley is the Betty House, but not because I'm not a huge antique nut. Um, I, I like them, but I'm not, I'm not a huge collector. But um, what I love about what Charlie Yetton did at the Betty House is he, he created a little niche market, right? So he combined his two loves, and that's what he's got. Whole barns full of old chairs and old political posters. Charlie's a former state senator, loves politics. He's in the right state for it. Uh, that's the Betty House. But he lives in Northwood, which is also home to one of the funniest New Englanders I've ever met. <clears throat> Rebecca Rule. Becky Rule is a hilarious woman. Prolific author has written all kinds of books about New England, about New Hampshire, for adults, for kids. So years ago, Becky came out with a new book, a new book, which was kind of a glossary of New England terms called Heading for the Rhubarb. And when I read the book, I thought, you know what, Becky, you would be the perfect person to answer this question that has nagged me for a long time. I've met so many New Englanders over the years, like really old salts in Maine and Vermont, you know, people who are in 90s, 100 years old, and who have told me that they're not a native. Uh, what, you know, somebody who looks like Mr. Maine. Um, and so, you know, say, yeah, well, no, you know, this guy in Maine told me, he, no, because he moved there when he was six months old. I mean, come on. So I said to Becky, I said, when do you, in your opinion, become a native in an old, small New England town? And I thought she had a brilliant answer. When the last person in that town who knows when you move there dies, congratulations, you're a native. So now we're going to move out of, Vermont, out of New Hampshire into Vermont on Route 100, uh, north on Route 100 out of the state's capital, Montpelier, you will find another stone face, believe it or not, at Mount Mansfield, highest point in the state of Vermont, Stowe, uh, where I, I, I try to ski once a year. Um, you, can't, you can't see it so well in winter, so I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to look at it in summer. But on Mount Mansfield, there is a stone face. The stone face of Mount Mansfield, less well known, and it is said to, to kind of look like a, an old man lying down looking up at the sky. Can you see that? Let me flip it for you. Now what? Now, now does that look easier? It's got a forehead, nose, chin, Adam's apple. Yeah, you got to work at it a little more. I always say to folks, you know, what the, what the stone face of Mount Mansfield does basically is just make you miss the old man of the mountain all the more, right? Um, I mentioned I ski at Stowe, try to ski at Stowe once a year. That's all I can afford, um, which is where this place comes in. Because back in January, before the pandemic hit, so I, I like to think of this trip up to Vermont in January 2020, this year, uh, as being one of the few bright spots of, uh, of an otherwise pretty dark and gloomy year. But um, somebody had told me, they said, you know, have you ever been to Northeast Slopes in East Corinth? I said, no. They said, oh you've got to check it out because, because I know this person knew that I don't like big glitzy resort ski areas. And I like old timey traditional New England ski areas, which are harder and harder to find. Um, but they said, you got to check it out. And I was so glad I did. The thing that makes Northeast Slope so unique is nobody makes a dime from it. It's entirely volunteer run by the local community, entirely volunteer community supported, very retro. I mean, it goes back. It goes back to the 1930s. It's rope toe, still in use, still the original, is now the oldest continuously operating ski toe, period, in North America. And it really is, part of what's wonderful about it, it is just the focus is on the community. It's not about people getting rich. It's not about, you know, people driving and staying. There's no, there, there, there's no, there's no hotel. There's no, it's really, it's really a throwback. You know, there's a lot of um, um, low-income families that live in the five towns surrounding East Corinth. Uh, kids ski there for free, period, all the time. The, all the local schools come there once a week during the winter for their gym program. Uh, the, the equipment's all donated. How retro is Northeast Slopes? Well, you know, I've talked about it, you know, resort skiing. So the big resort skier today, which is what I don't like about skiing. I love, I've skiing since I was six and I love the act of skiing. I love the sport of skiing. I don't like the business of skiing and what it's become and the fact that it prices many, many people from ever skiing because it's so expensive. If you, if you go to a place like Vail 
even here, Okimo, Stowe, Killington. You know, you can spend 30 bucks on a sandwich and a drink at, at lunchtime. So at Northeast Slopes, I spent $10 for a lift ticket and I spent $6 for their signature Nor'easter burger. And it was one of the best days I've ever had skiing in my entire life. So we are done in Vermont. We are now more than halfway done with our road trip. We're plunging south where we're going to re-enter Massachusetts through the Berkshires. Now, I always think, like, if you think, if you ask nine out of ten people what they think of first when they think of the Berkshires, I'd say a majority of people, right, would say, oh, Norman Rockwell, you know, uh, maybe we would say Tanglewood, um, uh, Stockbridge, right, Lennox. So, there is Norman Rockwell, one of Stockbridge's most famous former residents. He spent the last 20 years of his life uh, working and living in uh, Stockbridge. There he is working in his studio. And in fact, that red studio in the, in the color picture is now the grounds and, uh, of the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, that scene of Stockbridge, painted, of course, by Norman Rockwell. If you know anything about Rockwell, you may know that he, one of America's greatest illustrators ever, right? And he also, um, very famous for using only painting from real life models. Almost every photo, um, um, illustration painting he ever made included real life people, right? Uh, and, and what's less well known is that those last 20 years of Rockwell's life when he was living in Stockbridge, he devoted a lot of time to America's social issues, to creating some works that had to do with America's social issues. Um, here he is in 1964, working on a very famous painting, a uh, very courageous young girl, Little Ruby Bridges in uh, New Orleans. And she in that picture is followed by a couple of US Marshals as uh, she was prepared by her mom who just died a couple of months ago, um, prepared by her mom to uh, take a very big step for a little girl and integrate an all white segregated school in New Orleans, Louisiana. And that was his, his, his painting, Rockwell's painting, The Problem We All Live With. In 1967, he painted a painting, he was commissioned by Life Magazine. They were doing a special edition on race in America. And uh, one facet of race in America, which this painting had to do with, which was the integration of America's urban neighborhoods. This is a real place, Rockville, Illinois, families of color moving in. Everybody in that painting was a real life person in Stockbridge, Massachusetts in 1967. Um, and I want to draw your attention to the young African-American gentleman and his sister, which was actually his cousin uh, in real life. Um, his name was Ray Gunn, W-R-A-Y-G-U-N-N, Ray Gunn. How great a name is Ray Gunn. I would have paid my parents to rename me Ray Gunn. Uh, Ray Gunn, his grandfather was a good friend of Norman Rockwell. They spent a lot of time together. and. Um, my sense is that in 1967, there weren't a lot of families of color living at that time in Stockbridge. There aren't a lot today, but there were even fewer then. And I'm sure Rockwell told the elder Gunn about this commission and that he needed a model. And I'm sure he said, my grandson Ray would be perfect. And he did. He modeled for Norman Rockwell. He was 13 years old when he modeled for Norman Rockwell in 1967. No longer 13 when I met Ray Gunn in 2006. There he is. Uh, and he is in that painting. He was uh, giving tours at that time at the Norman Rockwell Museum. And I asked him one time, I said, Ray, how does it feel? You come to work every day. And at your work, there is a painting by a world famous artist. And you're in the painting. I said, how's that feel? And he looked at it. And he said, well, I suppose it's nice to know there's some place in the world where you'll be forever 13. He had a very dry sense of humor. Lovely guy, Ray Gunn. So we are now heading east and we're heading back to Boston. Now, I wonder if some of you are thinking, wait a minute, uh, there are six states, right? Last time I counted in New England and we only visited four. And you may be wondering what happened to Connecticut and Rhode Island? Well, I'm in no way disparaging Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, I like when I travel to make a very clean loop, okay? I don't like making jagged extended detours. So my tour 
went uh, this nice clean loop, right? Up through the North Shore in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, back in. However, however, um, I don't want to leave out Connecticut and Vermont. Would never do that because I love, I'm kidding, from Rhode Island, because I love them both. I spent a lot of time, done a lot of stories in both. I've often summered in Rhode Island. So uh, I do want to quickly show you uh, and show these two states some love. You know, um, obviously, we all know that Rhode Island is the small state in America, right? Rhode Island would fit into the state of Texas 221 times. Um, but you know what? I devoted an entire chapter to Rhode Island in my first book, New England Notebook. Um, and the name of that chapter was Who You Call Them Small? Because one of the things that I love about Rhode Island, they don't take any you-know-what in Rhode Island. And Texas might be all about, you know, don't mess with Texas. I wouldn't mess with Rhode Island either, ever. Um, I love Rhode Island. And you know what, as big as Texas is, guess what you won't find in Texas? You will not find Rhode Island style calamari, which is the only way to go. You won't find a coffee cabinet in Rhode Island, ever had one? A coffee cabinet is Rhode Island's version of a coffee milkshake, their state drink. Nobody does a better job of it than the Delecta Pharmacy, which I can't tell you how many I've downed at the counter there at Delecta. Um, it's made with autocrat coffee syrup, which is <laughs> Rhode Island state drink. Um, Warren, it's by itself, is its own sort of special little place in Rhode Island because Warren, Rhode Island, is the smallest town by, by size, not population. Smallest town in the smallest county, Washington County, in the smallest state. So as I said, Texas might like to say, don't mess with Texas. Rhode Islanders would say, uh, or with Rhode Island either. Now, before we come back to Boston, Connecticut, I, one of my favorite stories, in fact, in my second book, all about New England's most famous feuds, Wicked Pissed, um, half the book was devoted to uh, the great story of Gustav Whitehead, who may have flown two years before the Wright brothers in Bridgeport, Connecticut. But I always say, if you're gonna associate one word with Connecticut, it better be pizza. Uh, and maybe some of you know the great pizza rivalry, which I also go through in, my, in Wicked Piss, my second book. But on Worcester Street, you will find not one, but two of the very best pizzerias in the entire country, Pepe's and Sally's, which share a family bond which share a family bond. Sally Consiglio was uh, Pepe's, uh, Frank Pepe's uh, nephew. And uh, today, these two places anchor book, like bookending Worcester Street. Um, people say, well, which do you like? Which do you like? Well, I got to go with Sally's. Uh, Bobby Consiglio pictured there. Uh, they did sell it to a new owner two years ago, but they are consulting. It's still unchanged. The original brick oven, you can see Bobby work in the brick oven. Uh, I just say I, it's the best pizza I've ever tasted. So desert anybody because I would never forget a promise. And I did say that before we finished our tour completely, I would do a quick lightning, lightning quick. My favorite diners, my favorite diners in the places that we visited. So we started on the North shore. That would be the Agawam diner for me in Rowley, Mass, just before the New Hampshire border up on route 1A uh, near Topsfield. Best banana cream pie I've ever tasted. In Maine, I got to go with two diners. One is in uh, Waldeboro, Maine, Moody's, one of the most classic New England diners you will ever find. If you ever get your hands on that little cookbook there, What's Cooking at Moody's, I still cook a meatloaf recipe from there. Uh, best, best meatloaf I've ever tasted, and that's their recipe. My other favorite in Maine would be in Biddeford, Maine, which is the Palace Diner. Partly what I love about it is it is the story of a diner that was able to be saved and reborn. Two wonderful foodies from Portland decided they'd chuck the foodie scene in Portland and they reopened a closed diner in Biddeford and just amazing stuff at the Palace Diner. In New Hampshire, gotta go with the Red Arrow in Manchester. Political junkie that I am, uh, it is the go-to must-stop place for political candidates uh, to this day. And there you can see, uh, our 44th president, Barack Obama, chatting up some folks some years back at the Red Arrow. In Vermont, also got to go with two. Both in southern Vermont, the Palace Royal Diner, the Chelsea Royal Diner. What am I saying? The Chelsea Royal Diner, West Brattleboro. Uh, partly because I just love that sign. Is that the best diner sign ever? And the Country Girl uh, in Chester, Vermont, another uh, diner that was able to be saved and reopened. And as we finish 
On our way back just before Boston in Worcester, birthplace of the diner, the Boulevard Diner uh, on Shrewsbury Street. Again, my favorite diner sign in the world because it doesn't say open all day. It doesn't say breakfast all day. It doesn't say come in. It doesn't say anything except diner. I love that sign. It's inviting. It's warm. It tells you come in. It's a friendly place. Uh, and what, what could say that better than a diner? So we are finishing back where we began. Talk about some friendly, welcoming lights of Fenway. We're back. We're safe at home. And I dearly hope that a year from now, those lights will have been on all fall and summer, and we will be back inside Fenway. And, uh, and we'll be back inside public libraries doing in-person events like that. <laughs>